everyone. I'm Susan Smith, and I'm one of the co-authors of this fantastic book, Fierce Awakenings. And I'm with Jen, and she's the author of The Wind That Whispers to Me. You mm -hmm. Want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Jen? Sure. Thanks, Susan. And thanks for, for taking on the role of interviewing me. I've been doing this with all the co-authors, so it's fun to be on the other side of this. I'm Jen Balco, founder of Always On My Way, and I am a fierce, awakened woman waymaker, helping to guide women through midlife pivots to greater creativity and to step forward with more courage and confidence. I'm also a writing mentor and helping people discover their voice through memoir and storytelling. And that is part of what led me to lead up the Fierce Awakenings Collaborative Book Project, where we have 11 other women, including, well, 12 women in total, including me, and 11 other women coming together to share their stories and how they found courage and confidence to walk through life's spiral path. So it's been so, it'll be a year, it'll be a 15 month project and we're publishing in September. And that's what I do. I help give voice to people who are looking to tell their story. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> that, you do a lot. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a feeling we could have, yeah, that's what I think. I had a feeling we could have just gone on and on with that. But right. we'll just leave uh, it at that. That's good yeah. enough. For that. <laughs> but I'd like to have you, I'd like to hear you talk about the fierce awakening that you had when you wrote, that you wrote about in the book and why sharing your story matters it it matters yeah this is it's funny because when i first picked up this project and it really came as sort of a a download from the wind i have this wind that sort of whispers to me once in a while and it gives me these little instructions that say gather up the women and go do something like write a book in this case it was before you're old and broken, go for a long, long walk. And I was 40, I was like 41 when that message came. And I told my partner about it. And in our mid forties, on my 44th birthday, we decided that we were gonna follow that and walk from Bangkok to Barcelona. Walk two continents, right? 16,000 kilometers over the course of many years. And when I, knew that this book was going to happen, there was just one moment in time that kept coming back as the story to write. And it was a moment in Uzbekistan, Central and Central Asia. And we were walking through this long stretch of nothingness, just like sort of barren land on both sides of us. Towns were really far apart from each other. There wasn't much to think about and much to do except to complain about how hot it was and how uncomfortable it was. And, and there's a moment where, where all of that made sense to me. And that's what the story is about. It's, it was, do I quit? Do I not quit? And where were all these other moments in life where I got a similar message like that? And the choice was to keep going. And the choice was to keep taking the next step, even though I didn't know exactly what was going to happen. We had this long destination in mind. We were going to walk to Barcelona from Uzbekistan. That's thousands and thousands of kilometers away, right? So what do you do when you're in the middle of sort of nothingness and you've chosen the next step, right? How do you view your life through that filter? And I wrote that this way and it kept coming back to this. I tried to write some other chapters. I tried to write some other stories. And it was... It was that, it was, there are all these big life things that are happening always around you. You're with group. I was walking with my life partner, right? That's another story <laughs> for another day. But we were, there were a lot of small moments that you had to make decisions. And I wanted to write that story because even as we're dreaming big and trying to be expansive and pivot and reinvent whatever is happening, especially in our 40s and our 50s, when, when we're coming into a new awareness of who we are, there are a lot of small little 
things to also keep in mind. And then in one moment of clarity, it could be the tiniest moment of the day where you feel this big expansive thing and it all makes sense. And then you keep going. But that's the story and that's why it matters is because it's about noticing these smaller things that you might not see. And then looking at the pattern of this over the course of your life of how it all adds up. Yeah, I think that's, <laughs> that's why I wrote that and why it matters. I think a lot of us are in that stage of not knowing where we're going next and then trying to figure out how, how it makes sense to move to where we want to go next when we don't always have the certainty that it's going to be okay. So true. That's so, 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 so true. Uh, there's a lot of questions I could ask about your journey. So <laughs> the obvious one is why? <laughs> why? Why? But I think you, so you do sort of answer that in your chapter. So I had uh, another question I wanted to ask you, another few questions that maybe weren't uh, discussed in your chapter. Mm -hmm. Um, in the wind that whispers to me, you share you shared that moment that you just uh, shared with us, and in in some ways that was physically and mentally challenging. But what I would want to hear is what are your awakening moments or observations about human nature along your journey? Mm -hmm. Did you share it, that? Yeah, it is um, just one of the most surprising and not surprising at all factors of the trip so when we when Luis and I set out for the walk we put a subtitle to it of exploring the world and searching for the kindness of people and um and we knew it was out there we had traveled and you Susan you know this too right you're an avid traveler like there are just so many good moments out there in the world and so many good people who are willing to help you and that's exactly we knew we could not do this whole journey by just kind of crawling into our backpacks and walking. We knew we were going to need help. And we knew we were going to need help all the time, you know, from simple things of like making sure we had water and food and some place to sleep and, you know, finding a safe place to sleep every night. And we kind of, we, we began to do this. We're open to invitations. And we would just kind of put our radars up a little bit every day to make sure that we were looking for the people who were coming into us. Like we kind of felt like people are gonna to come to us and they're gonna to wanna to help and we have to be open to receiving their help. And at the same time, gauging what kind of help they're offering, if it's sincere, if it's not. And that was the human nature part because I can't tell you how many invitations we got for tea, for water, for bread. People who were driving to work and saw us walking, went to the local little food stand up the road brought us breakfast, drove back on their mopeds and brought us breakfast because they saw us walking on the side of the road. People who invited us into their homes uh, to sleep out of the, the, the whole time we were walking, we had one third of that time we were invited into people's homes to sleep, like complete strangers on the side of the road. Do you need some place to sleep tonight? Sometimes we asked if we could put our tent in their garden or on their back porch or something. And most of the time that turned into you, well, we have a guest room or, you know, we'll just move the kids around and you can sleep in the kids room or you could sleep in this classroom or you could sleep um, in the back of, you know, the fire department or, you know, like it just turned into this very, very, very meaningful experience. And it, language wasn't a barrier, really. Sometimes it was, but there's enough human gesture that's common in the world that you can know and sense when people are really being sincere and friendly. And, and especially in these many of these countries that we, we move through, for example, Iran, like, yeah, they have, they, they're the most generous people we've ever met. Like the most generous, by far, the most generous people we've ever met. And the amount of invitations is overwhelming. Like sometimes it's like, oh my God, are we gonna go hang out with these people? <laughs> Or are we gonna walk? Or are we gonna hang out with these people? Or are we gonna walk? Like, what's the, what's the goal today? And 
going through some of these Muslim countries, particularly, like they have a long, long tradition of hospitality. And Susan, I know you know that. And they also have very nomadic cultures. When you look at the whole span of Central Asia and the distances people had to walk and get to different places, they have this inbred feeling of wanting to be helpful and take care of you because they you don't know where the next stop's gonna be. So that was something I really felt in a really profound way. And it's, we have a documentary that's out now. And, and one of the lines is, you know, one of the lines that I say in it is, this is the kind of kindness we need to bring back into our own lives, what we experience on the walk. And that's been a, a driving point for me and something I learned from the walk is, kind. You know, you, there's never, there's always more kindness you can give. I think that's what I'm learning still <laughs> years after you know it certainly is heartwarming and it's certainly something I think we need more of today and I also think that's really you almost answered my next question because um the fierce awakenings book is about women reinventing themselves mm -hmm. and I was going to ask you how did your walk help shape you or reinvent you yeah, it's a it's a really good question, Susan. And but it's funny because I I think a lot about reinvention, right? And I help women think of their reinvention. But for me, it's I can't say that it was complete rein, reinvention in some ways because I always feel like it's an accumulation of things, right? Like I feel like there's there's a natural course. Well, we're talking about the spiral path. Right. So I always feel like it's that, like you, you kind of keep turning and you go inward sometimes and then you're coming back around and outwards. Right. So you're always kind of coming up one more level or maybe you're going down and spiraling down. Sometimes that happens, too. Right. So in my mid 40s, I think that the, that this walk occupied most of this very like the 40s to me, it seems like a very, very important decade. It's like you did all your career stuff, you did all your school stuff, you did all the things everybody expected from you, and then you arrive to your 40s and you're like, I'm gonna do what I want now. And when you step into that, like, I'm gonna do what I want now, what matters to me, and then something like this adventure comes up, you can't go back. Like, that's the reinvention. Like, you can't really go back to what you were when you were 30, because now I've walked across the world, you know, with. 40 pounds on my back, carrying my home on my back. Like I can't go back to being who I was when I, before that walk in some ways, even though I'm not much different, right? But there is this like subtle thing because now I'm 50, right? So the, that whole walk marked my forties and it's laid the ground for who I want to be in my fifties, right? Which is just even not hiding, not, I spent a lot of my 20s and 30s doing things the way I should have done them. And then not also, right? Like I I didn't get married and just have kids. I got married and I got divorced and then I moved across country and then I moved abroad. And then, you know, I didn't do things exactly. And I, I left corporate a long time ago and started my own business a long time ago. But I was still kind of in that box of what people expected you know my family thought I was gonna be what I thought my family I was trying to be what I thought I was going to be and now coming back from the walk that reinvention is like I could just be who I am and you know if I want to wear a unicorn crown one day then I will <laughs> right if, if I want to be a dressed up superstar businesswoman I could be that too right I don't I don't feel the limitation anymore and I think I think the walk gave me that. Like it gave me the sense that there's not really a limitation. And yeah, I think that's where I'll leave that. So I hear you saying the walk changed you in a way that gave you more freedom to be yourself. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. Although I've always probably knew that, right? But I probably... I know that I probably played a little bit smaller in my life because I think I was afraid of being too big, right? Of being too much for people. You know, if I, I, I like to say I'm on a 30 year joy journey now, right? 
And joy is a high elevated emotion, sensibility, something you cultivate. But that's something in my own nature that I've sort of like, oh, if I'm too joyful, people are gonna think I'm stupid. If I'm too joyful, I'm gonna be judged. Like I'm not serious and I'm not uh, productive, right? Like these were sort of, and now I'm like, I could be joyful and I could be serious. You know, I could be a joyful leader who's working in service, for example, for this book, so that these stories come out to the women who need to hear them next. And I could be that torchbearer. And then I could dance around my living room with a unicorn headband. You know, I could be both. I could be all of that. And I think now, and I don't know if it's the walk or if it's just my 50s. You know, I don't know if it's just sort of like, fuck, fuck it, I'm 50. You know, like, I, <laughs> if I'm not going to do it now, what am I going to do it? When I'm 70? When I'm 90? When I'm dead? You know, like, so I'm kind of in that moment of, Man, if you don't like it, you don't like it. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to hang out with me <laughs> if you don't like it, right? Like it doesn't, it it matters less to me now what people think. And I think that's what where I'm going with it. Wow, wow. Yeah. I um uh, my next question was going to be asking you what you experienced from your walk that you apply to every day. And I think you just answered that. Hmm. From one specific thing that you can think of that you learned from that journey that you apply to everyday life now. Yeah, I think it's the, um, it's just the remembering. And, and I say the remembering because we forget every day. We forget what we're doing, why we're doing something. We, we kind of move ourselves into the, fields of expectation of certain things having to get done every day. And the walk was very present for that. Like we had distances we had to cover every day because of visas and things like this. But there were moments during the day, like those first moments of the day when you wake up and it's super quiet and the birds have just started to come up and the sun has just started to come up. And you look around and you go, holy moly, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Like I don't even know where I am in this moment. Like I know what country I'm in. I know what city I'm heading towards. There's a sign on the road that says it. Here I am in the middle of this place called earth. And there are some birds singing and I could just be with that. And that's that's the thing that comes back. Like just to take a moment, like we have swallows that circle around here. So just remembering every day to just, just stop for a moment and hear and look around you and see what you see in the world around you. It changes every day, every moment, right? And when you're walking at a pace of three kilometers an hour, like that is super slow. And you have miles and miles of sort of the same scenery, right? But there's always something different. The light changes. There's something in the distance that catches your eye, right? There's like a bird or an animal that scurries past, you know, like it, and, and I think that has given me a new ground to stand on is the, even in my frantic busyness, I could take a moment and just like water my plants, right? There's, there's no reason why. And I think that's what I'm trying to do is to bring back into my life is take the next step, keep doing it, pause for a second, look up at the sky, take a breath, step forward. You know, that's the routine. When I sit and listen to you, it just seems like there's so much I can learn from that experience. I just, I don't want to stop asking you questions. And, <laughs> and of course, there's all kinds of details about the journey that you weren't able to share in the short chapter. And uh, I know it's you a have documentary. a documentary. That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> what, is the, what is the name of the documentary and where can people... Oh, it's the same. It's the same as the, the website. Well, the trip website is Bangkok, Barcelona on foot.com. And the, the documentary is the same. Right now, it's still, uh, it's coming out of the festival circuit. We've had some good luck uh, with a few festivals. Uh, but soon, uh, by the end of 2023, we'll be putting it into a little bit more of a mass circulation and having more screenings. So yeah, it, that's been fun too. <laughs> In parallel, right? There's all these like parallel things going on but yeah and eventually I'll write a solo book about it 
That was my next question because yeah. I know <laughs> documentaries cannot, uh, three and a half years, a documentary is not going to give us all yeah. the information we want. So you know the best, Susan, documentary filmmaker in the yeah, room. <laughs> but what are your plans for the book then? Uh, there are some pieces that were written during the pandemic. We finished in 2019 and then uh, a few months later we were all in lockdown. So I started to write some of it and none of it, none of it feels like the right story yet. So, uh, which has been curious and I've been a bit surprised by that. So I put it on hold and then I got this sort of bigger impulse to do the, the Fierce Awakenings collaborative project because I think I needed to really understand more of the book and publishing world now. And I think a lot of what I'm learning in this experience is gonna come into that. And that's gonna make that book stronger and more targeted as opposed to just me writing about, you know, I walked 25 kilometers today and it was hot, right? Like it will add a different dimension to it. So I'm hoping to have something in 2024, 2025 with that. Um, great, great. Put me on the list. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, we'll see. But um, I think maybe we want to think about um, how you hope to connect with uh, women that are going to be reading the book and maybe talk about the five qualities it takes to walk the spiral path. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, you know, what I, if there's one thing I want the reader to get out of this, in my story in particular, is to just know that there's there's going to be challenges all the time. They're going to be physical. They're going to be emotional. They're going to be psychological. They're going to be heartbreaking and heart wrenching. But if you keep noticing and keep, or just even forget that you're noticing, and keep going, it will also be really heart filling. It will be soul filling. You'll get somewhere. It may not be where you always thought you were going, but you will get somewhere and you will come around this curve and you will look up at the sky one day and go, yeah, I'm just part of all that there is. And, and in my expression of all that there is, I'm going to offer this. And that's what I hope women get. And, and my chapter is the last chapter in the book uh, because I, I felt like there were all these big things that were happening in the book and everybody's chapters and there was a lot of different things and and some dramatic and some not and some more subtle and some not and I thought this is a good way to walk out of the book right just kind of feel the presence of of your own greatness in some way and and that's what I hope we all feel is that we all feel a little bit more courageous and a little bit more confident to keep going. And then the five qualities, right? Five yes. qualities. I was going, I, you know, I have oh, 10 and I was trying to narrow them down. So I'm going to say um, the first three that I know, like that I feel the most uh, tied to. I think you have to have imagination. I think, I think you need to connect back to like imagining things, right? Just because we get caught up in the day-to-day -day things of I gotta do this and I gotta do this and I gotta do this. And we lose our like sense of possibility beyond what we do every day. And I love the word imagine so much that I have it tattooed on my foot <laughs> in Thai letters, it's on my left foot. So that when I step forward, I step forward with this sense of imagination of dreaming into what's possible. And imagination is free, you know, <laughs> like it doesn't cost anything. So to find ways to come back into that sort of daydream state and, and feel the bigness of, of what is possible, which then kind of leads me to the, to the playfulness. We, we, we get so wound up in our lives that we forget that we can play, right? We just... We could take a dance break in our kitchen. We can go for a walk. We could pull out coloring books. And we could do that without judgment. Like, who cares? I have tons of coloring books. I don't care if people think I'm a five-year-old. I, I love it. I love just letting myself sit there for a few minutes and 
and filling in the colors of my life, right? In different colors of my life. The, and, and, and feeling that sense of giddiness when you allow yourself to play because life is sometimes really hard. It's just sometimes really hard. And you reach a point in life and one of the other co-authors was just saying this too, like, how can it be easeful? Ellison, she was like, how can it be easeful? And yeah, how can it be easeful? And how can you play with what's coming to you? So imagination and playfulness. And then we always talk about trust, you know, like you got to trust that you could do it. I don't think it's trust. I think there's something before trust. I think it's belief. I think you really have to believe that it's something's possible, right? Whatever you're dreaming into, even if it doesn't come to fruition, even if it doesn't, you know, even if it doesn't come out the way you want it to, there's something that, I mean, maybe it's more in the walk that I learned this. There were many, I quit a hundred times a day this walk, a hundred times, <laughs> like threw the backpack down, angry, pissed off, never going to do this again, going home, taking them, you know, done. And then there's this, and Luis never, for a moment, never once gave up on this walk. He always knew he was going to finish it. He always knew. And so I, there, it was my idea. There's no way he's picking up his backpack and walking on. And I'm like, well, if he believes so strongly that we can do this, then why am I doubting that I can do this? And that belief that it, it, there's something, and then you can trust right? But if you don't, you can't just put your trust into anything. It's all just going to fall out of the sky. Like the belief kind of says, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then the fourth quality there is the willingness to act on that belief, right? Because if you don't actually do the action, I don't know, maybe people, maybe things do fall serendipitously out of the sky. They do, but that's not really going to get you around the curve on the path. Like you could pause and you can wait, but eventually you're going to have to go again. You're going to have to choose your action step there. So that is, uh, yeah, the willingness to act. So that's my four qualities. Um, and then I think the last quality is a little bit, it kind of goes back to imagination, but in a slightly different way. It's like the, the quality of like the mad scientist who loves to invent, right? And it, you're inventing the path. Like we might think there's this fixed thing all along the way. And you probably have walked that path for a long time. You know, you, you did the school thing, you went to university, you got a job, you had a marriage, you had kids, you had this career and you get to this point and you're like, what am I gonna do next? And I think there has to be this little bit of like, all right, let me let me try to do a little bit of this. or let me try to do a little bit of this. and. But just like re, to, to look at something and move it and then reinvent it and see it from different perspectives. So maybe it's like invention and perspective kind of go hand in hand here as qualities because you get to choose that. You get to choose what you want to do. And if you believe it, if you imagine it, if you're willing to take action on it, then you have to invent it. <laughs> that's, that's like kind of the last step, right? Like just invent it. <laughs> and if it, if it, you know, how many experiments did you do as a kid, you know, for these science classes? And it just, the whole purpose of it was that it was a failed experiment so that you learned it was a failed experiment. And then you just did it again, a hundred times different and changed one little factor, changed one little factor, changed one little factor. And then it, boom, it worked. <laughs> you know, the volcano for the science experiment, like exploded, you know, or whatever it was. I don't want you to explode your life. That's not the invention I want you to create. <laughs> but I think those are the five qualities that um, I greet people with. Important. And while I, I was listening to you there, I just, you know, I'm, you can tell my age, but the song John Lennon, Imagine, still one of my favorite songs because, it, like you were saying, when I listen to that, it just, it like frees up something in me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're getting at is like this, um, imagine the possibilities. And, and then, yeah. yeah. And it and, is one of my, that, that is a, like the song is simple in so many ways and so profound, right? But it does, it does the same for me. It, that's one of the songs that just always feel like, 
brilliant, like just brilliant if that could happen. What step would you encourage your readers to take on their or the next step, I guess? What next step would you encourage the readers to take on their spiral path? I would encourage them to take a pause in whatever they're doing right now and to look back and map their significant milestone moments. And it might be really surprising to find out that the significant milestone moments, in fact, are not the ones you put on your resume at all. They're that like moment when you met a perfect stranger somewhere along and they said something to you and then you went to that webinar and then you walked out with a new idea. Like there is a, there's a whole bunch of significant mo moments and milestones that we have skipped over. So my, my, and we do this in the, in the writing practice a little bit, you know, just take a pause and pull out a piece of paper and just start mapping your life a little bit of what happened when and how did it change you? How, like, what was that impact? And if you give yourself enough time to do it, it will be really surprising what comes out. And, and it will be really surprising what you forgot and why that happened at that moment and why it matters in some other point in the future. But I think there's a, a moment there where it, yeah, map your significant milestone moments and see what comes up. Are you suggesting that they look at patterns or try to develop a pattern and look at, you want to explain, what, what do you think they'll find? What, what are some examples they might find? Well, you know, for instance, there's a, well, I'll use my own examples, for instance, right? And it's not the patterns that you're looking for first, but it's just this, there was this, uh, moment, not even too long ago, one of my dad's neighbors said to me, oh, you're, you're practicing meditation. Maybe you would like to go to this ashram in India, since you're going to India anyway, it's in the South, it's in Bangalore. And I think you'll like it. It was with that, just with that, that I started to look it all up. I went, I planned my trip around it. I was only going to stay for four days. I ended up staying there for two weeks. It's where I learned how to deepen my own meditation practice. It what it's what kind of sparked me into thinking that I could become a meditation teacher, which I, I am now also. And it was, but that's not something you would ever put on a resume, right? Like some neighbor, he doesn't even tell me more than a sentence. He's like, oh, I think you'll like this ashram down in the south of India. Just go check it out. And that's all he said, right? And from there I planned this whole thing that did impact a lot of other choices that I made, right? Because it was in that moment and feeling that grounded and that supported that I thought, wow, I can't believe I hadn't really deepened my practice before, right? It was like, I was half meditator at that point, right? So I think there's, there's these little things that happen and we're like, oh, that sounds cool. And then you, you, you don't really, you either take action about it or you don't. And it kind of sits there. And it was really for you to hear. It was really for you to act on. And you did. Maybe you acted on it, but you never really saw that that was the first step that led somewhere else. It's kind of like an unwinding. Like, what? how did you get from there to here? You know, if we think of it, if we stretch the spiral out and make it linear, how did you get from here to there? And what did you learn? And we don't do enough of that. We don't go back and look at that. Um, yeah. <laughs> great. Good, good example. I understand more now. That's yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Do you have anything else you want to add before we read the excerpts? No. Thank you. Are you sure? Nothing? You think we've covered everything? Oh. Susan, you're a great interviewer. I, I think we could talk for like six hours more. <laughs> we could. I, I'm holding back. I just I, there's so many details. But, there but are it's so many. Awesome. Details. It's but good I guess, also. you know, just, just in closing, I mean, the subtitle of the book is calling in the courage and confidence you need to walk the spiral path. So 
my parting words are just, you have a well, you have a well of resources inside of you that you don't even know that you have. Um, Luis and I talk about this all the time when we do presentations. It's like, when you're called to do it, it's surprising how much you have. And believe it, like believe that, believe that you have enough to resource your own courage and confidence and that the rest of us are here with you, you know, kind of in concentric paths, you know, willing to, to lend a hand. And that's what the book is. It's like extending a little bit of a hand and saying, come along and we're not gonna leave you stuck on the rocks over there, just, you know, keep coming, keep coming in and keep going.